different questions that people have asked me in each of those, and I, I jotted down a few that, that several people had asked me, and then I also got emails from people asking some other questions, and then I also just want to open it up um, to you to be able to, if any questions pop into your mind, that we'll give it a shot at discussing them. So keep in mind if you have a question that you want to ask. Let me go through a couple that people emailed me just today just to get us started, and then we'll start asking other questions. But uh, someone, this I love this today. I was just saved last weekend, and I'd like to know more about prayer. Are there any guidelines for prayer or praying? And I, I would say, first of all, prayer is just talking to God. So whatever comes into your mind, you can tell him. If you have something you want to ask him for, you can. But a really good place to start in the Bible uh, concerning prayer is in Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew 6, beginning with verse 5, Jesus said, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, people who wear masks, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then he adds on, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So, basic prayer is not about how you sound to people. Basic prayer is generally not even about being with other people. As Jesus said, this isn't a show that you put on for others. The best place to pray is in your own room. And we sometimes say closet, but it really isn't the word for closet. It's just the idea of going in your room so that you can be alone. And as he says, it's not about saying something really flowery. It's not about impressing people who hear you pray. It's just simply going in there. He knows what you need. He knows what you feel. Just be honest with him. And so I would say a great place to start in prayer is to read these verses over in Matthew chapter 6, but just to get alone with God and tell him what's on your heart. Tell him what you're thinking. Tell him what you're struggling with. Ask him to help you in things you're concerned about or to straighten things out for you that you might be confused on. Um, but just have a conversation. And if you're mad about something, just tell him that you're mad. You can tell him anything because he loves you and he wants to hear from you. In the sample prayer that he said, and don't just repeat it over and over again, vain repetition, but he lets us know. You praise God, hey, you're, God, you're in heaven and you're holy. Um, you ask him to bring you know, to full development, his whole plan for the universe. You know, give us, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done. And then simply, hey, ask for basic provision. Give us our daily bread. Um, and Lord, forgive us as we forgive others. And don't lead us into things that are going to be hurtful, but rescue us from evil. And you're the king. So that's a good outline a good place to start and I think sometimes for a new believer just to pray that prayer verbatim but really mean it from your heart and then just tell him whatever you think even you can come to him and say I don't even know what I'm doing 
I, I want to pray, but I don't have the language, and I don't, you know, I, I don't know how to do this right, but let's just have a talk. He's, he would love to hear you tell him about your day. He'd love to hear you talk to him about where you're struggling or where things are difficult in your life. He just wants to have a conversation with you. So that's one question. Um, here's another one that I'll do, and then we'll go on to some of yours if you have them. Um, somebody wrote to me and said, I was married for 25 years and I'm now divorced. I'm dating a man that I am in love with, but we are not married. Why is it wrong and sinful for two adults in their 50s to have intercourse as it is not like we are young and waiting until marriage to keep ourselves pure? Um, good question. And the idea of, you know, of maintaining sexual purity isn't just about remaining a virgin. It, but in 1 Corinthians, and I'll read this verse to you in chapter 7, Paul's talking about marriage and sexual behavior and things like that. And in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2, he says, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality or fornication, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So clearly what he is saying is that sex that you have outside of marriage is something that God says not to do. There are other scriptures that talk about that too, and the Bible calls it fornication. Um, it is, it's not the unpardonable sin or something like that, but it's damaging for a person to do that. There is something about sex within a committed marriage relationship that sets it off as being really unique. It's not just about being close to somebody or even loving them, but it's saying, I'm committed to being with you, and I'm committed enough that I have promised myself to you. We have taken vows of faithfulness between us. And so when you get involved in any sexual activity outside of marriage, definitely God says not to do it. But whenever God says not to do something, it's because it's way better for us if we do things his way. So ultimately, we have to trust him, even though we may not understand all of the reasons, and, and some of it may seem sort of silly to us. And I'm not going to make up horrible things that it's going to send you to hell or something like that. But if you want the best life that God has for you, you'll just do things the way he says to do them. And, but I can speculate as to a lot of reasons why God wants us to reserve sexual activity for committed relationships that are saying, hey, I'm with you no matter what. So that's my take on that. Now, Jerry has a microphone, so if somebody has a question, go ahead and raise your hand and he'll come. And we, the reason we want you on the microphone is so that when this is recorded and later available, I want people to hear the questions, not just the answers. So there's one, a couple back in the back, Jerry. Yeah, I have a Hi. Um, Acts 16, where the jailer, um, uh, him and his household become saved. I've always wanted to ask this question. Yeah. Why does Paul say that? Because I know it's an individual thing, our repentance and our salvation. So why would his entire household be saved? Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. And then Paul and Silas went to the jailer's house and spent the evening there, no doubt, talking to him. And I, I, it, there certainly isn't anything in the Bible that says if one person in the family gets saved, everyone else is automatically saved. Um, probably the best way to understand it in, in, in my my take on it, at least, is that he is saying, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And if your family believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. So this doesn't just apply to you. It applies to your household, too. And then by going to the household, I'm sure he shared the message of the gospel with them. So um, that's my, that, that'd be my take on that. It's, it's like if I said to you that, you know, if... You know, Cherie, if you will come up here right now, I will give you a dollar. And I'll give a dollar to everyone else here who comes up. 
It's the same. You want a dollar? Okay. <laughs> so if I, I could afford to give Sharia a dollar, but not everyone. <laughs> yeah, there's one over here. So, David, I, unfortunately, I missed the uh, sharing your faith. Uh, so if this is repetition, I apologize. But, okay. Um, for myself, I, I know and am, am ever grateful for the unique set of circumstances that brought me here to this church. Mm -hmm. But I have had friends uh, recently uh, say to me, <coughs> why do you believe? And, and I would really appreciate some advice in terms of how to uh, answer that question and, okay. guide, and guide them to their faith. I yes. Um, I would refer you to when I talked about sharing your faith. That's what I talked about for, you know, 50 minutes or something. But in a very simple, boiled down way, um, to me, you have to bring it back to the resurrection. The evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, all of the eyewitnesses that saw him afterwards the fact that they then laid their lives on the line, and if they had only said, okay, maybe he didn't rise from the dead, their lives would have been saved, but instead they allowed themselves to be killed just because of that conviction. And the number of witnesses, hundreds of witnesses who saw him after his death, um, to me that's the, the central thing that when I talk to somebody about why I'm a Christian, it comes back to that. I have not come up with a better explanation of you know, the resurrection other than that Jesus actually rose from the dead. But you can talk about how, you know, what plan do you have to fix the damage that's happening in our world today? What plan do you have to even fix the damage that happens in your own life? And the Bible presents a plan from God as to how best for us to figure out how to live life. And so that, you know, is important to share with people, too, in a very practical way that a faith in Jesus Christ is actually helping me to experience life in a meaningful way. And so you have that experiential thing. Um, you can certainly have what the scripture says and how it agrees on this. You can talk about the fact that for 2,000 years, millions and millions of people have put their trust in Jesus Christ and reported that their lives were incredibly transformed by it. But ultimately, to me, the, the bottom line comes back to the resurrection. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he didn't. And there's a preponderance of evidence that he did, in fact, rise from the dead. And so that's, that's kind of how I, that's where I direct the conversation. Rather than, and I, and I really want to keep pulling it back to Jesus when I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, and I really want to, you know, not hammer them about their sins or, you know, talk to them about other issues that are secondary. It's just like, hey, uh, if, if the Bible says Jesus rose from the dead and there were eyewitnesses that claimed that, and the other thing is, the gospel says that I can be forgiven for free. I don't have to do anything to save myself. So why in the world would someone offer someone that kind of grace, that kind of forgiveness for free and say, you don't have to do anything. There's no other religion like that. And that makes Christianity really unique, that, that it's a free offer that asks nothing in return. And you know, if people are giving you, I mean, if, if somebody who claimed to be God is offering you forgiveness, um, I don't know a better way to do that. So those are some of the things I would say. Back there. Yeah, I have a question, but I, I want to, Tina, ask her. <laughs> this is Lydia has a question about prayer. Um, she said, when we pray to Heavenly Father, some people follow by, uh, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Mm -hmm. And she felt Heavenly Father didn't die on the cross. This was Jesus. Yes. So, so is that an issue there? Yeah, you should think about who you're talking to. Jesus talks about praying to the Father in Jesus' name. So that's kind of a formula for prayer. But 
I think that we can also pray to Jesus. But if you're saying, dear Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me, that makes sense. To, when I pray to the Father, I say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. So it's just about thinking about who it is that you're talking to. Um, there are some people who say, you shouldn't pray to Jesus, you should only pray to the Father. But again, Jesus' examples, of course, he's not going to pray to himself. But in the book of Acts, when Stephen was being stoned, he looked up to heaven and prayed to Jesus. And so we know that if the first martyr of the church prayed to Jesus, it's certainly fine for us to pray to Jesus. But the general way that, that prayer is, and even with Paul in, in his epistles, in the examples we have of his prayers, usually praying to the Father in the name of Jesus, in the authority of Jesus. But certainly nothing wrong with praying to Jesus or praying to the Holy Spirit as well, but it's just good to think about it. But yeah, you're right. The Father didn't die on the cross. Jesus did. Um, in, in Luke uh, 24, 39, it says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bone, as you see I have. And we had said, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Does this mean that uh, Jesus was flesh and bone and had a spirit? with, Instead of maybe his blood, now he was, was filled with the spirit. But then how could he come through walls and in the rooms and stuff like that if he was flesh and bone? Yeah, that's a good question. But he clearly says that he is flesh and bone after the resurrection. It's interesting that they didn't recognize him until they saw those wounds. And we know from John's gospel that Thomas actually said, I don't believe it until I touch him. And so, you know, it, when Jesus said, a ghost doesn't, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like I do, he's saying, I'm a real person. I am a physical being. But how he could pass through walls, come into a room with it locked, um, I think that things that are physical can still have certain capacities. When you, if you study physics and, and dimensionality and things like that, that physical things pass through physical things all the time. You know, my voice as it's going, you know, sending waves through a wire, to, through a radio, to the soundboard and then to the speakers, it's going past all sorts of physical things and yet those waveforms are physical as well. So, so physically, in terms of physics, it's certainly conceivable that a physical body could be physical and even have flesh and bone and still be able to pass through something else that's physical. Yeah. Hang on just a second, he'll give you a mic again. I know uh, Chuck Smith years ago, I heard him say that the Lord lives in like a six dimension world where we're in a three dimension world. So that's why he would know the beginning to the ending and stuff like that. that yeah, he seems to exist outside of time. And so uh, we're, we've only scratched the surface of, in terms of the meaning of dimensions and how they work. And, and it's really, it's very highly speculative. So I don't, I don't teach on that kind of stuff a lot because it's only speculation and there's so much in the Bible that we don't speculate about. So, um, but it, it happened because it says it happened. But yeah, it's fun to, to entertain those kinds of ideas and go, wow, how? And then another question is, related to that is, when we see Jesus, is he still going to have his scars? Um, I don't know. You see... Jesus in the Gospels after the resurrection, but then you see in Revelation chapter 1 where he's shining white hair, voice like running water and everything. So perhaps he can even morph into, into different forms in order to see that. It seemed like even in the Old Testament that the angel of the Lord, who most people think is Jesus in his pre-incarnate state, could show up as a person 
could eat and everything like that, and yet still all of a sudden disappear. So um, I'm hoping that when we get to heaven that we will have those capacities as well because it would be kind of cool. I have two questions about the millennium. The okay, we'll one... answer whichever one's a smarter question. <laughs> They're both short. <laughs> uh, when does Jesus come uh, to separate the sheep from the goats? Before the millennium or after? It sounds like, uh, you know, when Jesus talks about that, Matthew 24, all of that discourse and everything, and Matthew 25, it sounds like it happens at the judgment at the end of the millennium. The so the <clears throat> that's, uh, but it's not always that clear. So, but he's not there dividing, you know, that doesn't mean that for us that we appear in that judgment. And, and right. it's really probably more, there's the judgment seat of Christ happens, I believe, at the end of the millennium. But when you're talking about dividing believers and non-believers based on really how they live is what he says there, whether or not you visited those who are in prison, whether you fed the hungry, clothed the naked, and all that, um, seems like more of a general categorizing that isn't necessarily a singular event. Ultimately, everyone answers to him at the great white throne judgment. Everyone who hasn't already gone to heaven and, and uh, you know, who has put faith in him. But then at that point, everyone's going to have to answer for what they did. But I think his... The, in the Olivet Discourse, it's probably at that point more of a general categorizing of, look, I know who's mine and who isn't based on the way that you live. So. And the other one is uh, about uh, worldwide when the millennium starts, will any of the unsaved uh, of the whole world be able to enter the not the ones that are born during the millennium, but the ones that unsaved Will they be able to enter the millennium, any of them? Yeah, the, it's a good question. It's not completely clear, but you know, basically two-thirds of the world's population will be wiped out during the seven-year tribulation period. So during that time, a lot of people get saved. So you presume that some of those people who got saved who didn't get martyred probably will continue on in the millennium, and they will continue to have children, and population could grow pretty fast when people are living to be hundreds and hundreds of years old. Um, it's not necessarily clear. Like, for instance, I could imagine that children who haven't reached the age of accountability by that time, kids who were born during the tribulation period, might be allowed to then continue on into the millennium. But there might be people who didn't take the mark of the beast and who, who for whatever reason, maybe they were just like super, you know, they were the, you know, Montana mountain people or whatever who they, they didn't necessarily believe in Jesus, but they're like not going to take the mark. Maybe they would be allowed to live on into the millennium as well. It doesn't say for sure, but those are some, those are some ideas at least. Okay. So in sharing your faith, you told us about the importance of infiltration, conversation, and invitation. Can mm -hmm. you explain a little bit more, please? Yeah, what was the first one? The first one is infiltration, Integral. conversation, okay, yeah, yeah. and invitation. Mm -hmm. So the idea there is that in order to reach the world, you need to integrate with the world. You need to interact with them. You, you can't just be totally separate and expect to reach the world. And at the same time, you need to be, as you're contacting with them, you certainly need to um, work your way toward the kind of conversation and the kind of contact that opens doors for meaningful conversations um, concerning, you know, concerning the things of the Lord, concerning matters of the faith and things like that. And so, you know, I think that, that as, you know, and probably what I was, let me pull my outline up here on that just to make sure that I'm not getting that wrong.
files coming up. The internet's a little slow, sorry. But I want to make sure that I'm, get, I'm not completely tracking with you on the outline, so I'm going to go to that section. Um, yeah, oh, infiltration was the first word. So that's like you need to deliberately make contact with people who don't know Jesus. And I talked about it is not isolation. It's not like let's just keep to ourselves and stay safe. It's we need to do life out there in the world because our job is to infiltrate people who don't know Jesus yet, not to just be separated. And then the second thing was the importance of conversation. Make sure that we get involved with people enough that we actually can converse with them. And then the final thing, the importance of invitation, is that at some point, you, it's important to invite them to get more information. It's important to invite them to come to church. It's important, ultimately, to invite them to accept Jesus Christ. So we infiltrate the world, we talk with them, converse with them, and ultimately leading toward an invitation. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Um, I have a question that is related to the brother who was just mentioned about the uh, flesh and, and blood of a Jesus' body. Mm -hmm. um, Ezekiel 37, dry bone come to back to life. Mm -hmm. Is that literal or that's a spiritual? I just want to have a footnote. I asked this question to my brother who is an engineer. His answer to me is, he said, if you know nano physics, this is totally possible. So if that's possible, then Jesus' body, a resurrected body, can pass through a wall. But I'd like to know what you think if that's literal or spiritual. The way I read Ezekiel 38, the most obvious explanation to me is that he's talking about Israel being dead and then coming back to life. So to me, that's talking about Israel becoming a nation again. However... If it is literal, it, he's, he's right that as long as you have any kind of genetic material and then you have a, a sufficient technology, you should be able to bring a living being out of genetic material. So it isn't impossible that that is literal, but when you read the whole flow of the passage and imagine what it meant to Ezekiel, probably, most likely, it's... It's bringing the nation of Israel back together because so much of Ezekiel is about how the nation has been broken apart. Uh, I have a question about the mark of the beast. Yes. So with the way the world's going today, with all the hacking going on and nothing is secure anymore, it seems that we're moving closer and closer to chip implants. Um, this technology has already taken place, and um, if we, if we, you know, look at what it says about mark of the beast, in other words, on our um, wrists and our forehead, um, doesn't it seem like maybe within the next 10 years or under, we'll all have to get chip implants for ID? But um, as a Christian, how do you? Um, how do you think about that? I mean, if, if that's the only way we'll be able to, um, you know, get credit, uh, pay for anything, um, pay for our food, are we just supposed to um, reject that? I mean, it could yeah. happen within five years. Sure. I mean, you know, and that's a little bit scary if we have to just say, no, I, I'll starve instead. <laughs> yeah, people have been talking about barcodes on your head or hand, uh, chips under your skin. They've been talking about that for 30, 40 years. Um, as somebody who follows technology, I don't see the Antichrist even needing to put a chip in your skin. You know, even though now they have chips the size of a grain of rice and it sells, it's great. Everybody loves reading about that. But the truth is with technology nowadays, they can, they can scan your eyeball. They can, you know, they check your temperature by just waving it across your forehead. So... Your forehead or your hand are both areas of thin flesh, so it's really easy. You know, to me, they would be able to put a system together that doesn't even require a chip that's actually, they can just read right through your skin. Most people aren't going to let somebody insert a chip into their skin. I, I know as a diabetic, they have some great, you know, um, 
blood sugar monitors that all you have to do is insert a little chip in and then it could read it through a watch, but nobody does it. There are a few people who will try it, but you're not gonna get people in a mass way to insert a chip under their skin. And with technology the way it is now, they wouldn't even need it. And so I think to me, that was all you know, 20 years ago, exciting that that might happen, but with technology the way it is today, they can control you any number of ways um, without ever actually having a chip. But I, you know, I, when I first, I bought the first computer that Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa ever had, and when I bought it, oh, people were just up in arms because they thought that was setting us up for the Antichrist because of computers. But you know, now no one really, now that I have a computer on my wrist, nobody really thinks that. So you don't want to get too dogmatic about a particular technology because technology advances so rapidly. The truth is, right now, the government and other people who are other governments, they know, they know everything that's in your pocket or your purse. They can scan all the information from your phone. They can do, so uh, technology has advanced past the simple chip under the skin thing. And so I, I, I think that's probably not even necessary to happen in order for the Antichrist to form a one world government. I don't want to make anybody paranoid, but this is the way it is. So what do you say is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is some sort of a commitment. And it may be a literal mark, but it may be something else. But it's, it, it seems to be something that they deliberately do it. It's not something that happens by accident. It's not like you just thought, oh, I just got a credit card. Oh, mark of the beast. No, it's people who deliberately align themselves with the beast, the false prophet, the antichrist. And whatever it is, whether it's a literal mark or whether it's a figurative and say, you're marked, you're counted, you signed up, you swore in. You did. It, it could be a lot of different things, but probably, I mean, it's hard to sell somebody on the idea of having their head stamped. Um, you know, on the other hand, it's really easy for people to, to figuratively give over their freedom. Our, it happens in our country and in the world all the time that people are giving up freedoms that they don't think, ah, that won't matter to me. But so uh, to me, it's probably something perhaps more symbolic than it is a literal mark. Okay, Jerry, down here, there's a couple. Okay, um, I've been looking at 16th century Protestantism, and I know that for a long time they, the position has been held that um, the woman riding the beast is um, symbolic of the Catholic Church, and, you know, I wondered what your perspective was. Yeah, I mean, I, it, there was a time when, and, you know, there was a book, The Woman Rides a Beast, and, there, you know, that, that people just looked at in Revelation, the, that woman riding a beast as being, it's got to be the Catholic Church. Um, it, what it is when you read the passage, it's really a picture of world religions, period. So I think it could certainly, it's going to, Islam has to be factored in there too. Perhaps there's some, some elements of Catholicism to it, but I think people jumped the gun by assuming it was Catholicism when at the time that people were saying this, Catholicism was the major world religion. Um, uh, it, it, is, it does seem to happen in Rome. That's the center of it. It makes you wonder, but I'm just speculating here. But imagine if, if the Muslims ended up taking over the Vatican and making that. It's what they've done throughout their history is they find Christian churches and they build mosques on top of them. So... You know, it depends how long it's going to be. If it happened today, you know, there isn't really a one world religious system completely. But when that happens, when the tribulation happens, give it a few years and I could speculate that there are several different ways that it could happen. But I certainly wouldn't identify it as the Catholic Church. And even if I did tie the Catholic Church in there, I would say 
It's the people that are left in the Catholic Church after, after the rapture comes and the believing Catholics are all gone, then that's, what's, that's what would be left. But uh, to me, when you read it, it seems to be more generally about a religious system than it does just a particular church. So. You mentioned earlier that you referred to Jesus as uh, angel of the Lord. Yes. Okay, then. Um, what about the uh, guardian angels? Because when something happens, like if almost in an accident or something, I, I praise Jesus and I says, thank you, Lord. Angel of the Lord watching over me. Mm -hmm. But then I always thought that was like a guardian angel, but you referred to him as Jesus. Well, in the Old Testament, when it talks about the angel of Jehovah, the angel of Yahweh, um, in several cases, it's pretty clear that it's, that it's Jesus, because Jesus talks about, for instance, Abraham saw my day, you know, and so when did Abraham see Jesus, who, you know, um, and, and there are several passages in the Old Testament where the angel of the Lord is then addressed as Yahweh, and he accepts that, so it, it, it's not clear in every case, but I think if Jesus, and Jesus is eternal, so if he, when he was around in the Old Testament, uh, he probably was at least some of those, we call them theophanies or Christophanies, where he actually appeared as the angel of the Lord and it was really just Jesus. But there are, you know, any angel could be called an angel of the Lord. And the Bible sometimes talks about an angel of the Lord did this, and that would just be any angel. And so our, you know, the angels that protect us, the angels that are ministering spirits sent out to look after us, um, those are just angels, those aren't Jesus. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us, so he's not zipping around here. He left the Holy Spirit to do that. He was God. Say that? I thought Yahweh was God. Yahweh is God. Jesus is God, too. So if he's the angel, messenger of Yahweh, um, then he's God as well. Hi, Dave. Hi, Jim. I had a question, too, on the eschatology um, some of the Calvary Chapel pastors have brought up the speculation, it's just speculation, that um, after the rapture there may be a gap of time before, um, you know, even the one world government begins to form. And uh, I've never heard that before. It's kind of new. It's, it's different that we just assume that there would be, you know, the rise of the world empire immediately following the rapture. But I was just wondering if you have heard about that or what you thought of I've that. heard people say that. I don't I haven't seen anything in the Bible that would even make me think that maybe that was the case, but I would never say it's not possible. Um, I think people are just thinking how could all this stuff happen in 7 years? But in our modern world, we realize man, stuff happens fast. 7 years is not a long time, but a lot of stuff can happen in 7 years. And a lot of stuff can happen in 1 year. So to me, it's, you, hate, you can speculate, but you hate to, to make up something that, that you don't see anything in the Bible that would kind of indicate it. And once you take the church away, then what do you have? It seems like the logical time for judgment to be poured out. So yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, think that that's the case, but I wouldn't fault people for making it up. You know, you, Speculation's fun as long as you know it's just speculation. I'll go to, I have another question here. We're getting towards the end of the time. Well, I can go through a couple. Somebody, somebody asked about drinking alcohol. Is it okay? Um, Bible makes it clear that getting drunk is, is wrong. So that's kind of a given. The Bible talks about alcohol in a way that that Jesus and his disciples drank wine. Jesus made wine at a wedding. They, when they did the first the communion, I'm sure it was actual wine that was a part of their culture. To twist the scripture and claim that they weren't actually, you know, drinking alcoholic wine, but they were just drinking grape juice, is you know ignorant of history and scripture. But at the same time, I want to say this that I don't drink at all. 
And it isn't because I'm a Christian. And to me, you don't need to come up with a Christian reason for everything that you do. You know, I haven't drank alcohol other than a couple times when somebody gave me something and I sipped it and, eh, you know, and that was it at a wedding or something. But in, you know, I haven't drank it in, you know, close to 40 years. But I don't drink because I've watched it destroy so many people's lives that it just makes me sick to think about it. I've, I stood there out in the street and watched a man who was just on his way to work as a cook in the graveyard shift, and, and he was hit by a drunk driver, and I was holding the blanket up to keep people from taking pictures of his body as he lay there, and a picture of his seven-year-old son is floating in his blood, and I can't get that picture out of my mind, and it has nothing to do with what the Bible says about wine. It's like something that does that to people, I just assume stay totally away from it. But at the same time, if, if you have the liberty and, and you're okay with having a glass of wine with dinner, having a beer at a game or whatever, I would never tell you that you can't do that. I wouldn't make it a biblical issue. For me, it's just a very personal issue and, and I like leaving it there. Somebody asked if self-defense is warranted, like should we be pacifists or can you defend yourself? Um, the disciples, on several occasions, but you could look in Luke, well, in, Luke, in John we saw that, that they said they had two swords and Jesus said it's enough. But in Luke 22, Jesus said, if you have two coats and no sword, sell one of your coats and buy a sword. They didn't use swords for cutting their food up. It was a weapon to protect your life. So clearly Jesus was okay with him and his disciples being able to defend themselves and uh, so, and, and at the same time, it, we were just in John 15 a few weeks ago where Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's defending somebody else. He sees that as a very honorable thing. So the kind of pacifism that, you know, people would say, oh, it's wrong to, to go to war or, you know, whatever. No, not according to to what the Bible says, Romans 13 says, that the government doesn't bear the sword in vain. And so um, you certainly have every right to not defend yourself, but if you break into my house and you threaten my family, you'll die. So that's my take on it. <laughs> or I will, one or the other. Yeah. Every word of the Bible is true. John 3.3 3 says, you have to be a born-again Christian before you enter into heaven. Is this true? Well, you're, you're misquoting it a little bit. In John 3, G, there was no such thing in the Bible as a born-again Christian. That's a term that, you know, has been made up over the last 70 years or something like that. Jesus did say to Nicodemus, a Jewish teacher, that unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom. And so Jesus never used that term again. None of the disciples, Paul, Peter, John, James, none of them used the terminology born again. So that's the only way I would be like, ah, you know, but Jesus, a, a better one is John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Salvation, there is neither salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I just would, would hesitate on using to be a born-again Christian since that isn't a biblical term, and I'm big on what the Bible says, but you, you don't get saved without having Jesus Christ save you, for sure. Uh, Thank you. Uh, with what you said about self-defense, with the persecution of Christians in North Korea and the Middle East, what are we called to do? As a nation or as individuals? As, indiv as brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, I think we have to, everyone has to see for themselves. Like, like I would defend somebody else's life, but I wouldn't necessarily devote my life to defending everyone's life because I couldn't do that. But there certainly, if God spoke to me 
and said, you are to go over there and help defend those certain people, then that's something that I would do if God showed me to do it. Um, but you know, I, I, I hesitate to just say that we all have the same obligation to go and defend everyone. We certainly need to defend ourselves. We need to defend people who are close to us. It's a slippery slope when you try to defend a nation of people against their government that it, you know, has some form of legitimacy of power and they choose to, to live in a place like that or they're stuck there as to what our nation should do to, to do away with that, it's a tough one because um, we have got ourselves into a lot of messes and most of the world hates our country because we're trying to protect people who can't protect themselves. So it, it, there, isn't a, there isn't an obvious answer. My, you know, my thing was you definitely can't say that defending yourself and defending others is a wrong thing to do. But you can't defend everyone either, so um, that's that. Uh, one, oh, there's one more. Okay, this will be the last one, and then I have one more that was written down that I wanted to answer. Hi, in the beginning you were talking about if we don't forgive, then we won't be forgiven. Yeah, Matthew can, 6. Can you give us your definition of forgiving? an individual to an individual. That's a heavy scripture, that if you don't forgive, he won't forgive you. Jesus said it, so I'm not going to just make excuses for him or anything like that. I don't know what, I don't, you know, I know that certainly there are people that I don't forgive because I don't even know that I needed to forgive them. And so uh, you know, he isn't saying that you have to perfectly forgive everyone in order for you to be forgiven. He's stating a general statement in the context of the Lord's Prayer and saying that you need to be the type of person who will forgive others if you want to be the type of person who will be forgiven. Probably, if you can't forgive others, you probably don't even understand your own need to be forgiven. I know the more that I have to be forgiven the easier it is for me to forgive others. So uh, the way I take it is it's just sort of a general thing, but I try to forgive everyone just in case Jesus actually meant precisely what he said. But, uh, you know, you have to put other scriptures with it. It's not super easy, but that's my best take on it. It, it makes me want to forgive. What does forgive mean? Forgive means that you are not going to continue to hold resentment against someone for what they've done to you. Forgiveness does not mean that you treat them the same way. I can forgive someone, that is, I release them to the Lord. I release what they have done, and I refuse to carry it in my head for the rest of my life and be bitter against them. But I may never be friends with them again. You know, you, you can forgive someone without restoring a relationship. If somebody burns you really bad, it shows you more about them than it does about you, and that's not a person you want to be friends with. Forgiveness, when I forgive someone, it's not for them. It's for me. It's something that I do in my heart. When I, if you do something bad to me and I forgive you, it's because I don't want to give you free rent in my head for the rest of my life. It sets me free when I just say, that happened, it's over, I'm moving past it, and I'm just letting it go. And so basically, that's what forgiveness is. It, it's not a relationship term at all, like guaranteed to go back into a relationship. It's just simply saying, I'm not going to carry your bitterness in my head. So this is a question that was sent me to me today by um, uh, Bill Boynton, and it's an interesting question. He said, the church has been re-energized on multiple occasions over the millenniums through revival. So there are different revivals at different times. You had box seats at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa to the Jesus Revolution revival. Can you share your insights and a few stories about how it started, prospered, and ended? Who? that's a, it's a long question, but a, a really important one too, a really good question. 
the, what we call the Jesus movement just seemed to kind of come out of nowhere. Um, if you really want to study it, you, if you weren't around then and, and you really want to hear the history of it, there's a really good book. A guy did his doctoral dissertation on the Jesus movement and talking about what happened at Calvary Chapel and in England and in the Bay Area and all, all different places, Hollywood and Long Beach and other places where revival just burst out in, in the late 60s. Um, his book is called God's Forever Family. And it, you, know, you can get it on Kindle or, or you can find it on Amazon. But basically, God started working within certain places. And some of it was in churches like Calvary Chapel. I mean, Calvary Chapel, and it was so exciting to see it. Crazy stuff was happening. People were just coming to the Lord like crazy. A lot of it was Lonnie Frisbee, a guy who was really kind of a psycho, but he had this kind of, he had certain powers that I don't even know how to explain, but he could just, he would, he could, you could be riding with him in a car and he would stop the car. That guy over there, he'd go over there and two minutes later, the guy's crying, he's on his knees, Lonnie's leading him to the Lord. Um, so sometimes when people are crazy, they'll try stuff that sane people won't try. And God just blessed that. It was, it was really crazy. But Pastor Chuck started allowing some of the musicians to come. He didn't turn the hippies away when they came. It was a unique time in history when the counter, countercultural revolution was happening. And it was all about peace and love and togetherness. And, and so the Bible works Jesus is a perfect character for that kind of a world because Jesus was kind of an early hippie in a way. I mean, he was homeless, he moved around, he, didn't, you know, he seemed to break all the rules, he was rejected by religious establishment. So seeing that happen was amazing. What's amazing, though, is to know that the Holy Spirit was doing the same thing at a whole bunch of different places, and they weren't all connected. And so, you know... I try not to talk about the Jesus movement a bunch because it just sounds to younger people like you're saying, you guys are never going to see anything like this. You had to be there. There were a lot of really bad things that happened then too. There was a lot of, it was messy and ugly and all that, but, but God did an amazing work and a lot of people got saved during the late 60s, early 70s. Um, my theory on, on what happened to it, why it... Really, the, the Jesus movement as we know it, and everybody likes to say, oh, it's still going on today. No. If you think that, you weren't there. Um, it lasted for just a few years, really. And what happened is everyone began to organize it. People began to try to protect it. People, uh, other churches wanted to cash in on it, and so they started sponsoring Christian coffee houses, concerts instead of being free concerts became pay a lot of money for concerts. We got celebrities where the best Jesus music bands used to just go to the park and play for free. All of a sudden, the contemporary Christian music business happened. The, all of the denominational churches wanted to get in on the act, and every one of them had certain rules that they brought with them. So you had, yeah, let's do Jesus movement, but it needs to be Republican, or the women need to wear bras, or you can't have, you know, you can't do this, or you can't dress like that anymore. And to me, and it's not just because of those things, but the religious establishment just sort of, in trying to cash in on it and participate, they just kind of ruined it. It's like, it's like if kids are playing sports just in the street, and then somebody starts a league and gets uniforms and you have to pay to do it and we need umpires and something gets lost when you do that. And, I, and to me, other than just that the Holy Spirit, like Jesus said in John 3, he's like the wind. He just goes wherever he goes. You hear it, but you don't know where it came from and you don't know where it goes. I don't know if we can even totally explain why he came the way he did and why he left the way he did, but over a period of a few years, um, it went from vibrant, exciting, explosive to church. And 
And you know, I'm not sure all the reasons why, but I'm thankful to have seen it. I always hold out hope that God, certainly there have been other revivals and there will be again. The, this will kind of blow your mind, but when I look at today's society and I think what could be the equivalent of the Holy Spirit pouring himself out in the drug culture with sex, drugs, and rock and roll and working like that when that was the predominant counterculture of the day. And the best, the best example I can think of would be if the Holy Spirit just poured himself out in the gay, lesbian, transgender, and bisexual communities. <laughs> and which I'm not predicting that that's gonna happen and I'm too old to lead the charge, but at the same time, that the way that the organized church looks at gay people today is the way the organized church looked at drug heads and you know pot smokers and acid freaks and all that then. It was really, it was very spookily similar. So if God poured his spirit out in that gay community, who knows? But you always just have to be asking him to do a work. And if he does it, are you going to fight against it? Or are you going to praise God for what he's doing? That's revival. The Holy Spirit does it. It's just a question of we can stop it or we can choke it out and make him do it somewhere else. Usually revivals don't happen in organized structured churches. They usually tend to happen out on the fringes somewhere and people pitching tents and doing revivals or people in communes in the, in the 60s and 70s in Haight-Ashbury district or you know, Laguna Beach or wherever. Um, it it kind of works that way, but I would never, the reason why that revival happened was because the Holy Spirit did it. I can sit here academically and evaluate it, but I remember Pastor Chuck several times saying, I hope that no one ever writes a book and says, here's how, here's why the Holy Spirit worked the way he did at Calvary Chapel, and here are the rules that we followed in order for it to happen. There are people today who think that, that Calvary Chapel is simply, wow, it's just teaching the Bible through the Bible, simply teach the word of God simply, we don't, and that those things are what made the Holy Spirit come. That's not true. The Holy Spirit goes wherever he wants to go. And he's not really looking for somebody who's doing it right in order to show up. And in the 60s and 70s, the Holy Spirit was pouring out in a powerful way with all kinds of churches who weren't teaching verse by verse. And ever since then, there are a bunch of churches who do teach verse by verse, and you don't get the sense that the Holy Spirit's doing anything there at all. The Holy Spirit works because he wants to work. For us, it's like, are we going to acknowledge that he's doing something or are we going to fight against it? And I don't, I don't say that just as an academic thing. I get concerned when every time it seems like God is doing something, people want to tear it down. They want to criticize it. They, I, nowhere has this been more obvious than with the way that people attack Rick Warren. I don't agree with everything Rick Warren says and does. I certainly wouldn't do church the way he does it necessarily. However, if you go see what God has done at that church, you find out how many people in our church met Jesus at that church, then don't sit there and tell me that, no, that wasn't the Holy Spirit. You're putting yourself in the position of being a Pharisee and you're actually fighting against something that God actually wants to do. I personally am not into the big evangelistic crusades, but am I going to be bummed because 4,000 people just came forward to accept Jesus in, in Arizona? No, I'm not renting a stadium and I'm not doing that, but I'm not going to fight that. God just works in all sorts of different ways, and anytime God is working, there are going to be Pharisees on the sidelines claiming that it must not be God. And those people miss revival. It's the same thing with some of the wacky, you know, charismaniac churches. Despite the fact that they're really nuts, a lot of times 
God did some amazing things. There are probably some of you that God got a hold of you through, you know, even like a Melody Land or a Robert Schuler or a, you know, Peter Popoff or TBN or whoever. Look, God seems to like using crazy people sometimes because they'll do anything. I don't want to ever be the person who looks at something that it seems like people are praising God in it, and I'm just going to go, nah, that's not God. Because I'm old enough to have lived through the time when that's what the established church has said, and they missed out on something amazing that God did. So that's something that I think that we need to be aware of. The Holy Spirit's the one who does revivals, but stay out of his way. And don't, don't ever stand in the way of what he's doing. Don't ever speak against something that it looks like God's doing it. Hey, the, there's, it seems like part of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit even is to claim that something that God's doing is of the devil. When the Pharisees were saying that about Jesus, he said, be careful, man. You're getting really close to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So it's like, hey, people are going to do stuff, whatever. We'll see what lasts, but, but man, to be opposed to something, even if God might be doing it, is a really dangerous place and a dangerous way to live your life. I would rather just go, well, good for them. Let's see how this works. You know, maybe, because God wants to reach people who aren't like me. And there are some people who won't be reached except by somebody who's like very different than I am. So... I don't ever want to be saying, that's not the Holy Spirit. You've got to be blind to not see that God, through his Holy Spirit, did some amazing things at Calvary Chapel. But you have to be blind to see that God did some amazing, to not see that God did some amazing things at Saddleback Church or at Garden Grove Community, Crystal Cathedral, or at all sorts of other places. Don't get so, go where you're comfortable But don't be putting down something that somebody else is naming the name of Jesus, is telling people, if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he's God, he died, he rose from the dead, salvation comes from him, you better not speak against that. Let it go. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't think you should speak against any church no matter how goofy they might be, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out half the stuff we believe just wasn't even true. We just misunderstood the Bible. So let's just not judge other people, but let's say, okay, God, where can I see that you might be working? And I'm going to go to work in prayer that you will pour out your spirit on this particular situation. Because God will use people, and then sometimes he'll just discard them if if they aren't good people. He, it's the only kind of people he has to use is bad people. So that's good for us. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We could talk about it all night. Um, we read your Bible. We do come up with all kinds of questions. And, and some of them we can take a shot at answering them. Others, we just get more questions. Because you're bigger and smarter than we are, you see the big picture in a way that we don't. But ultimately, we are here because we believe that Jesus Christ is the answer. And that if we have him, the rest of this is just interesting exercises of education. Thank you for giving us this evening. Thank you for giving us this series. And um, I pray that it's been helpful to people, but we pray too that as these recordings and the workbook and everything is available online that you would use these, this series for years to help people get grounded in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.